So in this video, we're going to talk about section 7.1. Chapter 7 is all about integration and some further integration techniques beyond just substitution. Um, 7.1 is the simplest of these called integration by parts. Okay, so integration by parts. And what this is going to do is it's a rule that will let us undo um, a differentiation of a product. So it lets us undo the product rule, basically. We know that when we differentiate a product, we have this rule f prime g plus g prime f. And that's how we differentiate a product, right? If you have a f of x times g of x, it's the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. We know that rule. We learned it back in chapter two, back in calc one. Um, and that's it. So that's integration. Uh, well, that's the product rule. Integration by parts is actually just going to take this formula. And what we're going to do is we're going to realize that f times g is just the integral of the derivative of f g prime, okay? And so we know from the product rule that this is the integral of f prime times g plus g prime times f. And so this tells us that f times g is gonna be equal to the integral of f prime g plus the integral of g prime f. Or if we wanna word it the way that the book does, the integral of f prime times g is equal to f g minus the integral of g prime times f. Okay, I never memorized the formula for integration by parts. You can do it in two steps. You know the product rule and then just solve for one of the integrals on one side. That's it. Okay, so integration by parts. If I were to write it more formally, okay, integration by parts says that the derivative of f prime times g dx is equal to f of x g of x minus the integral of g prime of x times f of x dx. And so this is integration by parts. Okay, and so that's the formula that we're going to use over and over and over in this section. There's a differential form of this uh, that gets used a lot as well, and you've probably seen this in the book, but if you have the integral of uh, u dv, this is going to be u times v minus the integral of v du. Okay, and so here what you have is uh, basically you have the same formula just in differential form. Your u is your g of x, your dv is your f prime dx, okay? And then you can figure out the rest of that, how that goes. If you like this formula, if you've seen this story before and if you've done integration by parts before and you like the u dv stuff, fine, that's no big deal. I like the f prime and the g uh, notation just because I think it's a little bit easier to, to look at. Um, and so, what I want to do first, either one is fine, okay? But I'm going to use the f prime and the g version of this. So let's go through and let's do some examples. And what I want to do first is let's just start by integrating x times e to the 4x. Now, this is not something that we can integrate right away. If this was x e to the 4x squared, this would be a substitution problem because you could let u be 4x squared if there was a square there. And then your du would have an x in it. But the problem is that if you let u be equal to 4x, then your du is going to be 4, and then there's no way to kind of compensate for that x. So the fact that you have a product is what hints that we want to undo the product rule. And so what we need to decide now is what's our f prime and what's our g? And remember that f prime is the function that we're going to integrate, and g is the function that we want to differentiate. And so the function that we want to integrate is e to the 4x. The one to differentiate is just x. And then if f prime is e to the 4x, well, that implies that f is going to be 1 fourth e to the 4x. And if g of x is x, then g prime is 1. And so we picked x here to be the function that we want to differentiate so that when we take its derivative, it gets simpler. You get a smaller power. So here our g prime is 1. And so let's see what our um, formula says to do. So if we have the integral of f prime times g, this is going to be equal to the integral of f times g. So that's 1 fourth x e to the 4x minus the integral of g prime times f. So minus the integral of 1 times e to the 4x dx. Okay, g prime, I'm sorry, g prime times f, so it should be one fourth 
e to the 4x. I forgot the 1 fourth there. And if we integrate this last thing again, now this is something on our list. This is just e to the kx with a constant in front. We end up with 1 fourth x e to the 4x minus 1 over 16 e to the 4x. And then, of course, this is in uh, general um, uh, just the antiderivative, so we need a plus c. Okay. Um, yeah, and let's just check. Let's say that this is our y. Let's just check what's y prime. So if we differentiate this function, let's see what happens. This one fourth we can factor out. And if we differentiate x times e to the 4x, we're going to get the derivative of the first, which is 1 times e to the 4x, plus the derivative of e to the 4x, which is 4 e to the 4x times x. And that's the derivative of the first term. The derivative of the second term, we're going to subtract, um, let's see, 1 16th times the derivative of e to the 4x. So that's 1 16th times 4 e to the 4x. The c differentiates to 0, so that's old news. And lo and behold, look at what's going to happen here. The 1 4th and the 4 balance out so that we get x times e to the 4x. Okay, and notice that also you have one fourth e to the four x minus one fourth e to the four x, and so those two terms cancel, and we really do just end up with x e to the four x. So uh, the point here is that this really is the function. So this one right here really is the function whose derivative is x times e to the four x. Okay, and so that's. In a nutshell, that is how integration by parts works. Okay, I'm going to do a few more examples here. We'll do some more complicated examples in class together. But let's look at uh, the integral of x squared uh, sine of pi x dx. Okay, and then after we do this, we'll do one definite integral so that we see how this works with definite integrals as well. So we have x squared sine of pi x. And what we have to do is we have to decide what's our f prime, what's our g. Our f prime is going to be sine of pi x because the thing that we want to differentiate is going to be x squared. And if f prime is sine of pi x, then um, let me leave a little bit of room here. Then our f is going to be a negative 1 over pi cosine of pi x. And our g prime is going to be 2x. OK, and so that's how that's going to work. And uh, this means that we're going to end up with, so this integral will be the integral of f times g. So that's negative 1 over pi x squared cosine of pi x minus the integral of f times g prime. So that's uh, plus 2 over pi x cosine pi x dx. So just to talk through where everything came from, we subtract the integral of f times g. So that's, since we're subtracting, that makes that a plus 1 over pi times 2. So that's 2 over pi, and then x cosine of pi x. And now this reduces the problem. So we can't solve this problem right away yet. But if we have x times cosine of pi x, that's better than in x squared times sine. So how can we evaluate this integral again? Well, we do integration by parts again, and that's no problem. So what we're going to do is just off to the side, we'll do another integration by parts. So I'm going to copy down what we have. So pi x plus 2 over pi. And then uh, in here, we'll just kind of input what we need. And so let's evaluate now. So we've reduced our problem um, to just being x times cosine of pi x. And so here I'm going to pick a capital F and capital G, just that it's more clear what our, where everything goes. So I'm not reusing the same, the same terms over and over, at least not the same exact terms. So if capital F is cosine of pi x and g of x is x, then capital F is going to be the integral of cosine of pi x. So that's 1 over pi sine of pi x. Um, g prime is, of course, 1. And we end up with capital F times capital G. So that's 1 over pi x sine of pi x minus the integral of 
f times uh, g prime. So minus the integral of one over pi sine of pi x dx. And so that's going to be one over pi x sine of pi x, just copying down the first part. And then let's see, if we integrate sine of pi x again, we're going to get uh, negative one over cosine. So that makes us plus one over pi squared cosine of pi x. Because we get negative, um, we get negative one over pi times cosine. So negative one over pi times negative one over pi is plus one over pi squared cosine of pi x. And so that's the missing piece here. So this should be one over pi x sine of pi x plus one over pi squared cosine of pi x. And then of course, plus C. Okay, and so that's that antiderivative. I'll leave it to you to check, it's not hard, but I'll leave it to you to check that that's the right thing to differentiate uh, to give us x squared times sine of pi x. So with that being said, let's look at uh, the integral of, uh, let's do um, x e to the negative x from zero to one. Okay, so we wanna evaluate this integral. This is a definite integral now, and we could do Basically, we could do this one of two ways. We could first find the antiderivative and then apply the fundamental theorem of calculus directly, or I'll show you how to do integration by parts with definite integrals, and it's not too hard here. Um, our choices are gonna be very similar to what we did before. We have to figure out what's our F prime and what's our G. So our F prime is gonna be the thing that we wanna integrate. That'll be E to the negative X, and our G will just be X. So that forces our F, to be negative e to the negative x. So that's ne one over negative one, negative one e to the negative x. Um, g prime is of course one. And so this is gonna be f times g. So negative e to the negative x times one. I'm sorry, uh, times uh, x. So this should be, sorry, f times g. So that's negative x e to the negative x from zero to one minus the integral of f times g prime. So that's negative, the integral of negative e to the negative x. And so what we're gonna do in the way that we do this is if you have bounds here, now we're not substituting. I wanna point out, we are absolutely not substituting. We do not change the bounds. If the bounds start from zero to one, then they stay whatever they are. So if the bounds start from a to b, then they're a to b all the way through integration by parts. Integration by parts is not substituting. So we do not change the bounds. We keep them as they are. What we can do though, is if we want to like simplify along the way, we could evaluate each term from zero to one as we go along. So for example, this first term, when we plug in one, we can factor out the negative, but when we plug in one, we get one times e to the negative one. So one e to the negative one minus zero. We get zero times e to the zero. And then we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna evaluate this integral. This is now just a normal chapter six integral. We're gonna get negative e to the negative x from zero to one. And so this first term is just a number. It's just negative one over e. And then when we plug in zero and one for the second term, we're gonna get one over e minus e to the zero, which is one. And so altogether, the negative one over e terms are gonna be, um, they're gonna uh, give us negative two over e. So this will be uh, one minus two over e. Okay, that's our answer. E is about 2.7. So this is something like two thirds and that makes the whole thing about one third, just to give you an idea of the number. Okay, but that's how that works. That's how uh, integration by parts works with definite integrals. So you just kind of keep the, uh, integral as we go along. Okay, and that's really the whole story. Now we're going to do in class, we'll do lots of examples of integration by parts. To help speed this along a little bit though, I want to do one or two kind of uh, tricky integration by parts problems. Okay, um, and so uh, I'll do that in the, in the following video. So this will be kind of integration by parts, but there's a few integration by parts tricks that I want to show as well.